All right, here we go. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the main episode with Jim. If you missed it, I'll put a link to it somewhere up here. And uh, we're going to now ask him the patented trademark thrilling three final questions of existential reality, requiring Jim to look into his crystal ball and predict the future in two of the three questions. And the first one, Jim, has to do with what's known as an ethical will, not a material will, where you bequeath the BBC donations and some of your many chairs that you own there, you know, to some needy cause. But instead, what ethical wisdom or knowledge would you like to impart to future generations when you spring forth this mortal coil, as the Bard said, at the biblical age of 120? Ah, well, um, I mean, you know, so, so you come from a Jewish background. My parents, my father's a Muslim, my mother's a Christian. So it's, it's sort of crazy mixed up in terms of Abrahamic religions here. But I'm, I'm, I'm a humanist. Uh, and, and, and in a sense, that, that can mean lots of things for different people. But what I would say is that what I would like humanity to be thinking is have compassion have kindness, show empathy, not because you feel you should or because you're ordered to or because a holy book tells you to, although that's fine if you do, but because it defines you as a human being. So for for me, you know, being kind is because I want to be kind, being compassionate and and, and showing empathy. That defines what I, so I'd like people to do that, not because, you know, I want to go to heaven or because I don't want God to punish me if I'm not, but because it defines your humanity. It's kind of like the uh, sort of self-interested, but in a beautiful way that you put the reason you do science in the main conversation that we had. Uh, it's it's not only good for others, but it's good for you too. I, I love that answer. Absolutely. Thank you. Now the next one, we're going to go deep into the future. Uh, and you know the movie 2001 Space Odyssey. Mm. Uh, there are these monoliths with uh, sort of primates that discover them and try to hit it with a bone or whatever. Um, we don't know, really know what they are. And they're sort of like sentinels. Are they time capsules? Are they watchers, uh, as, as uh, Paul Davis? Davies has said, or something like that as possible, lurkers. Uh, but I want to know if you had access to a billion year lasting time capsule, what would you put on it or in it to summarize the joy, but also the knowledge that we've acquired as scientists uh, in this brief span of human existence? This was a difficult one. I know, you know, uh, Richard Feynman said, you know, I would just tell the world everything's made of atoms, right? And, and like from that piece of information, he hopes we could build up all, all our knowledge. That's that's too simple. I think you need more than that. But I don't want to sort of be putting in a, sort of a, a stack of um, physics textbooks either. That's sort of a bit a bit boring. Um, I, I'm I'm far too modest to suggest I put any of my books in a capsule. But a book that I I, I find profound and beautiful is actually a book by you know our, our hero Albert Einstein. Uh, he he wrote. The, um, the, the special and general theory that, that this man here, um, he wrote the general and special theory of relativity. He wrote it in German in 1916. So it was very, very soon, within a few months of publishing his general theory of relativity. Um, and then it got translated into English. And it's a beautiful little, it's, 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 a, it's a popular science book, but it contains some absolutely profound ideas. He kept adding appendices at the end of the book in, in, in which he explained the nature of space and time and gravity and so on. I think something simple like that, from which we can determine, you know, the nature of space and time, is timeless. And I, I you know, I don't think we, you know, we may we may advance on Einstein's theory of relativity one day. We may go beyond it to something more more sophisticated, but that doesn't make it wrong. So Einstein's little book on relativity is what I would bequeath. I saw that it came up. You're in, you're in luck, Jim, because I saw the original signed edition just came up for sale in German uh, wow. for a mere twenty thousand pounds. So oh, if wow, you fantastic. want. If you want, you can take some of your material, Will, and we can... No, I'm just kidding. Last just question. I'll have a Christmas present from you. <laughs> you can get everything. You're half Muslim, half Christian. I'm I Jewish. Like. <laughs> I was an altar boy in the Catholic Church. Yeah, we can Fantastic. do everything together. We're, we're one two, two-man ecumenical uh, you know, co- co- uh, collaboration. Okay, Indeed. last question, because I want to be respectful of your time. Last question involves Sir Arthur C. Clarke's so-called third law. By the way, do you know his first, his first law is pretty famous. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Right. His second law, I love to drop on my department chair from time to time, and it goes like this: For every expert, there's an equal and opposite expert. Uh, so these you, right. you Brits, you, you're really good with those mots juste. But his third law says the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. The origin of the name of this podcast. Oh. 
I'm going to ask you, Jim, as a 20-year-old, 30-year-old, you go back in time through your time teleportation device. What do you tell 20-year-old Jim to do, to give him the courage to do as you've done to go into the impossible? I think it will be the advice that I don't need to, to be so concerned about not knowing as much as everyone around me. You know, when you're starting off, you know, as a young scientist, you, you feel somehow that there's so much I don't know. Am I, maybe I'm not smart enough. Maybe I, I'm not working hard enough. I realize now that I can't know everything. And, you know, if I wanted to, if I could go back in time and, and become an expert in an area that I know not, nothing much about now, I could. But the brain is finite. You know, we know what we know. We learn what we can. And it's okay not to know everything. It's okay not to have all the answers is probably my advice. Yeah, as I put it to uh, Barry Barish when he came on a couple of years ago, uh, he said he had the imposter syndrome, which you talk about in the book, The Joy mm. of Science, when he saw this guy's name in the ledger that he signed to get his Nobel Prize. Uh, you have to sign his ledger. And he looked back and said, I'm not worthy. I said, uh, Barry, uh, did you know that Einstein held Isaac Newton in the highest regard. And Einstein had the imposter syndrome about Newton, who he said wow. did more for human culture than any human before or since. And then I said, Barry, there's a top off to the story. Guess who? Isaac Newton felt the imposter syndrome about. And he said, who? And he said, Jesus Christ Almighty. Uh, <laughs> Isaac Newton lived in eternal shame that he never lived up to the <laughs> ideals of, of, of the great. Uh, everyone, genius. everyone suffers. Everyone suffers from imposter syndrome. <laughs> well, Jim, it's been a joy talking to you. You're one of my favorite people. This is one of the reasons I got into doing this podcast. Oh, I hope fantastic. we can meet in person someday, uh, either here in America, in California, maybe uh, during a winter or over there across the pond. Have a great rest I of your day so and feel too. better too. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic.